Welcome everyone to this Rebel Wisdom Showcase. Today, I'm particularly excited because we're welcoming Dennis McKenna. And Dennis is a visionary ethnopharmacologist and he's really a psychedelic pioneer as well. So he's a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute. And he's also one of the first scientists to really uh, study ayahuasca as well. Uh, he's written several books, including The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, which I highly recommend and follows his adventures with his brother Terence. And more recently, he founded the McKenna Academy, which is a, a not-for-profit not modern-day mystery school um, and much more. I, I think I'm looking forward to discussing that in a bit more detail. But Dennis, uh, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And thanks uh, to your audience and, and just generally thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Dennis. I mean, it's a, it's a real pleasure. And um, the first thing I wanted to ask you about, so I think we're living through a pretty strange, dangerous, exciting time in psychedelics. So, you know, psychedelics are, are going mainstream very quickly. Uh, we're seeing a rise of you know, psychedelic capitalism, a big gold rush. It's something we've, we've covered quite a lot on the channel and been quite focused on. And, you know, as, as one of the elders of, of this kind of um, community movement, whatever you might call it, I was really keen to hear, what do you make of all of the, the changes in the last few years? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm astonished for one thing, you know, I mean, I think back in the day, we never imagined that, uh, uh, you know, that psychedelics, that something like psilocybin would rise to the position that it has and begin to be recognized, you know, for its virtues, because these were all, and they still are pretty much schedule one controlled substances in the States. So, and similarly uh, in different countries, they're, they're not ill, they're not legal by a long shot, but I think the momentum of recognition that these are actually important medicines, that they do have value as medicines, that's changing the conversation. So I, I'm delighted to hear that because, you know, I, I mean, I, I do think that these medicines are, are valuable for individuals, but also catalysts for social change and, and that sort of thing. But then I'm also a bit conflicted because, you know, uh, this, this gold rush to cash in the capitalist side of it, it's inevitable and it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I'm not anti-capitalist, but I am pro-ethics. And I think here's the, here's the issue. We, if this is going to, the psychedelics are going to be integrated into mainstream society or our, you know, global society. We have to recognize their origins are in indigenous societies, indigenous cultures. And we owe big debt to them for being the stewards of this knowledge for essentially thousands of years. And in order to bring psychedelics into global culture, uh, we need to acknowledge that debt and especially the, the venture capitalist side of things needs to make a moral ethical commitment to giving uh, indigenous people some stake, you know, hopefully a big stake, but just being, you know, implementing reciprocity, you know, we owe them a lot for just keeping this knowledge and keeping the genetics as well of the plants, you know, and all of that is now threatened, you know, and uh, so, you know, the, uh, on balance, I think the trends are are good, you know, uh, the, the potential of psychedelics for healing is being recognized. That's a huge thing, you know, but the devil is in the details. Having said that, how do you make that work? How do you make it, how do you integrate psychedelics into, you know, biomedicine, mainstream medicine at the same time, keep your moral, you know, compass, keep your moral balance, recognize these are not just a new drug, a new cancer drug, or a new kind of, you know, medicine. These are a very special class of medicines, you know, and so it creates special problems when we try to bring, you know, this rather fragile 
indigenous knowledge together with with the global culture. It's it's a it's a minefield. But that doesn't mean it can't be navigated. We just have to be clear eyed about it. And um, and you know that's happening. I mean, there there is plenty of talk about these dilemmas, you know, and how we address them. Yeah, and this is something I, I wanted to, to talk to you about um, because you've spent a lot of time in, in the Amazon, for example, and, and in the field as, as an ethnopharmacologist. And so I think you probably have a, a unique view on how that reciprocity could take place or maybe some of the ways. Uh, so I'd love to hear about that. But before that, it might be good to define what ethnopharmacology is because um, it's not the most common word in the world. And so um, it'd be great to get a, a little definition of, of um, yeah, what, what it is. Okay, well, it, it, in, in, you know, it's, it's not so complicated. There are various definitions, but the two words, ethno, meaning people, and pharmacology, meaning the study of drugs, you know, that would be the simplest thing. But I actually have a rather tortured definition, which I like. And there's a reason that has many parts, but there's a reason for each part. So my formal definition, the one I favor, and not by any means insisting this is what it has to be, but my definition is ethnopharmacology is the interdisciplinary study of biologically active substances used or observed by humans in traditional societies. So that that's a little tortured, but it, it's important because it's not only about medicinal plants, you know, it can be about many things that are not used as medicines. For example, arrow poisons are a good example, totally within the scope of ethnopharmacology and not necessarily ingested, you know, I mean, indigenous people don't ingest arrow poisons, but they use arrow poisons. You know, so that would be an observation. And then the limitation to traditional societies, you've got to limit the scope somewhere. And that's where you limited it because in a certain sense, pharmacology as practiced in, in science is also ethnopharmacology because it's, a, it's an activity that people carry out. But, you know, ethnopharmacology as we think of it is looking at indigenous uh, cultures, societies, and their relationship to biologically active substances, which may be medicines, may be foods, may be poisons. Uh, and these cultures are generally quite sophisticated in all of these areas. Mm. So yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the torture definition, but of ethnopharmacology. It wasn't that bad, it was all right. Um, yeah, no, that's great. That's really useful. Um, and you know, it's interesting. It's interesting that the, the focus is is on um, I suppose traditional or, or indigenous societies. And yeah, so that's what I wanted to, to delve into a bit. You know, we have a situation where um, large pharma companies are now synthesizing, for example, psilocybin, um, mm -hmm. which has been used by you know, for example, the Mazatec um, ceremonially for, um, for for quite a while. And that, you know, you pointed to this um, a second ago, like that's a very strange and interesting dynamic because the molecule itself is the same molecule. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and, and so what, yeah, could you talk a little bit about that, about the reciprocity side of it? Like what, what is an ethical or a potential ethical way for those, those companies to be giving back to the, the communities that, you know, without whom we wouldn't even know about these, these medicines in many cases? Well, I think I think there's lots of play, lots of ways in which the corporate world and the, uh, you know, basically the corporate world that's trying to develop these things can step up to the plate and provide reciprocity. And it may not be necessarily related to these medicines, but a lot you know a lot of these cultures have pressures of all kinds, you know, for resources and so on. Uh, in the case of and the preservation of their uh, indigenous knowledge, not only related to medicines, but, but really the whole, all of the cultural elements of their culture, which are subject to, you know, rapid change like everything else. So I think the, uh, whether you, whether a company is making synthetic psilocybin and using it, and there's nothing wrong with that, synthetic psilocybin is 
people say it's not natural, but I would remind you that all of these synthetics are made by completely natural organic chemists, right? So they are, they are within the scope of nature. Uh, and in some ways it's better that uh, psilocybin may be the exception, but in some ways it's better that these substances are synthetic and used that way because then you're not putting pressure on a natural resource. With, with uh, natural psychedelics like peyote is a big one, ayahuasca, iboga, these are all uh, essentially endangered species. And the reason they're endangered is we love them too much and there's over harvesting and a lot of pressure on these, on these uh, indigenous medicines. So one way that the, the investment community and the, and the global community can help is to work with indigenous communities to develop sustainable ways to produce these things. Mushrooms are kind of an exception because they're, they're not endangered. <laughs> they're anything but endangered. And because of the way they can be produced, you know, so there's no supply issue with mushrooms. There are some company that are companies that want to use mushrooms instead of psilocybin. No problem because they can grow tons of it and it's easy and, and nobody's going to run out. Uh, but the ones that are more fragile, like ayahuasca and iboga, uh, you know, these have remarkable properties, may have uses that psilocybin does not, but there's a supply issue. So one thing that, uh, uh, you know, companies can do to acknowledge that is make commitments to help indigenous societies, you know, develop adequate sources of these and, and just support the culture in general, you know, make sure that those folks have a big stake in all this, a place at the table, call it a give back after, you know, to try to make up for the centuries of biopiracy, you know, and it's not just psychedelics, but, you know, probably, you know, four fifths of our food plants came from the new world and came out of a culture that that was part of their culture. Europeans came in and more or less co-opted them. Very rarely was anything given back. So now we're in a place where we have to be clear about that there is an obligation. You know, we need reciprocity. We need to restore the damage caused by centuries of biopiracy and uh, you know, that's easy to say, but then how do you do it? You know, it, it's the mechanism of how you make this work. It, it doesn't simply work to say, well, you know, we'll give the government of Peru X million dollars to support uh, indigenous cultures. Well, you know, that's not gonna get to the indigenous cultures. You know, uh, that's gonna go into the pockets of politicians and, and things like that. So, so, like everything else, the devil's in the detail, but maybe better things to do, better ways to approach this is to support NGOs and uh, outfits like that. Like one of my favorites is uh, ICERS, which some of you may know, uh, ICERS stands for International Center for Ethnobotanical Education uh, research, uh, ethnobotanical education, research and service, ICERS.org. And ICERS is a great organization and they, they have more or less adopted uh, ayahuasca and iboga as their, their main thing, although they are concerned with to peyote and some of these other things, but their main focus is ayahuasca and iboga. And they're trying to deal with a lot of issues, for example, uh, not only sustainability, but also uh, they've created, for example, an ayahuasca legal defense fund to come to the aid of practitioners, shamans, curanderos, and so on, who go to other countries to do ceremony. Maybe they're not aware of the law, or maybe they're just not careful, you know, but they get popped, they get busted and then they face prosecution. And ICERS actually has a bunch of lawyers that will come to their, you know, to their defense. 
and I'm on their advisory board. I often, you know, I mean, I, I don't have time to, to be in all of these things, but I often do give advice and testimony to those kinds of people. So that's ICERS, yeah, visit their website. They also do a wonderful conference uh, called the World Ayahuasca Conference every couple of years. Yeah, definitely a second that. Um, shout out to ICERS. I have a, a few good friends who, who work there. Um, really, I, and you know, it's interesting. What the, the phrase that just came to me was their hearts in the right place. And th that, that goes to something that I was thinking when you were talking is that, you know, this, this question of um, <clears throat> indigenous reciprocity, I think is as much about um, how it's done and the attitude and the respect with which is done as, as what's done. And mm -hmm. I, um, I had a, a debate with Lars Wild, the, who's one of the co-founders of Compass Pathways, which if anyone's not familiar is, is the, uh, a major um, psychedelic pharma company. And that question came up around uh, reciprocity. And in, in the aftermath, there were quite a few comments on the lack of thought that seems to uh, be there in Compass in terms of, of engaging. And I think it, it speaks to me of a difference between corporate culture. Um, and I'm, I'm also not anti-capitalist. It, it's more about, um, I'm more concerned about differences in values and differences in culture. And so I was also keen to kind of get your thoughts on that because you know, I've, I've been in the psychedelic space uh, for so it was like my whole adult life, basically. And even in my lifetime, which is considerably less experience than you in this space, I've seen this just tremendous change, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've noticed changing is the culture. And what used to be quite underground, radical, um, and you, you and your brother were, were a big part of that, you know, bringing ideas forth, which were exciting and different and, and potentially transformative. It's now feels like a lot of the weirdness has been stripped out and it's very biomedical and it's very, uh, very kind of in line, which I, I get as well. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a problem to have that strand, but I'm particularly interested in, in how, how we might maintain the flame of that, um, transformative potential burning. And so I was curious to hear, hear your thoughts on that. Like seeing as you are, um, you're so instrumental in it, like did, what's your feeling around the culture around psychedelics right now? It's a complicated question, but uh, I think one of the things is that psychedelics are not so scary anymore, you know, and they've been around in our culture for, you know, and, and sort of part of the culture, even though they were made illegal at, pretty much at the end of the 60s with the Controlled Substances Act and all that, but they never really went away. I mean, there, there were low points, but they were never completely abandoned. And I think partly what has changed is that all those people back at the, in the 60s and early 70s, my generation, you know, I mean, we were just young hippie rebels or whatever at that time. Well, now we're old and respectable, more or less. And, uh, and, and I, I think many of the people who have had these experiences with psychedelics are now in a position in regulatory agencies and, and corporations and, and science and government and so on. So, uh, you know, and, and they, they've had their own experiences. So they know that you know, and they remember them as valuable. And, and so they know that they're not many of the stories and horror stories that were propagated through the 60s are just not true. So there's a more reasonable, there's not the, uh, you know, feeling of hysteria that there was, you know, back then. And uh, many people have recognized their value. And uh, psychiatry is you know, got its own problems, but psychiatry is beginning to come around and recognize that, you know, basically a lot of the medications that are used in psychiatry are not so good, not so effective. And these appear to be much more effective for certain things. So, uh, so attitudes are changing in, in that respect. What I don't want to see, what I am concerned a lot about the corporatization and the biomedicalization of psychedelics. I think these things are inevitable, that they will be integrated into medicine, that there will be you know, clinical protocols 
what I don't want to see is a, a situation where there are two forks where, you know, if you want psychedelic therapy, you can go to a clinic, you can pay $30,000 and you can have a psychedelic therapy session. But if you want to go to a retreat center and take it in an indigenous culture or context, even if it's, even if it's uh, not necessarily a indigenous, but maybe a, a retreat center that, that adopts that approach of a ceremonial rather than a clinical approach, or if you simply want to go into the woods and pick mushrooms and, and eat them, people should have the right to do that. And they should have the right to, uh, you know, to, to seek out more traditional ceremonially based uh, therapies as well. It's simply not true that psychedelics have to be used in a clinical context to be safe. I mean, they've been around for 10,000 years and, you know, the FDA has been around for less than a hundred. So we don't really need the FDA, you know, to tell us that this is safe or not. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the situation. I, I don't want to see a situation where the natural psychedelics are, uh, are prohibited, you know, and, and people only, because for one thing, then it creates an economic divide. Most people cannot pay a lot of money for therapy, that kind of money, and they shouldn't have to. I think it'll be a while before medical insurance pays for psychedelic therapy, although maybe sooner than we think, you know, and things are developing rapidly. Yeah, yeah, that, I think that that um, that healthy ecosystem, many different approaches is, is something I, I feel really strongly as well. I, I think, you know, having clinics and churches and, and walking into the woods as well, um, and it, yeah. reminds me of another thing I was curious to ask you about, and this is a real question for an ethnopharmacologist, I think. There's a lot of information coming out at the moment around dispute as to how long, um, for example, ayahuasca has been used in the Amazon. And some people mm -hmm. saying thousands of years. Uh, I think I read something a couple months ago that said, oh, it's probably about 200 years. And then likewise, in Europe, um, there's there's quite a lot of debate as to uh, whether our, um, whether people were using uh, the indigenous psilocybin mushrooms that grow, for example, here in the UK, you know, there's a there's a scholar called Andy Letcher who um, who, who maintains there's no real evidence that there was ceremonial use, um, and you know that's it's very contentious. It seems it's very kind of strange. But specifically with ayahuasca, that's something I was I was kind of curious about. Like, how, what? Yeah, what what is your take on how long the use has has been going on for? Well, ayahuasca is a tricky one, you know, to, to get it nailed down in terms of its timeline. A lot of these things, uh, uh, there's an archeological record because there is uh, uh, essentially there's specific paraphernalia that's associated with it, like snuffs, for example. I mean, snuffs, uh, DMT containing snuffs have been used in the new world for at least six to eight thousand years maybe even longer than that and there are snuff trays beautifully carved snuff trays and and snuffing tubes and this sort of thing so it's pretty much that confirms it you know that that these things were being used ayahuasca is a liquid it's served in vessels so any number of things from chicha to you know uh carrot juice could be served in vessels and in the absence of chemical analysis, you can't really tell that chemical analysis is possible with the residues of some of these, some of these things. But uh, you know, most people don't have the uh, you know the resources to do that. One thing you can do is uh, look at the iconography of the ceramics and so on. There's an interesting artifact known as the Quito bowl which is in the Museum of Anthropology in Quito, Ecuador. It's called the Vaso de los Brujos, the, the uh, glass of the, of the wizards, glass of the sorcerers. It's all got all kinds of theriomorphic iconography and serpents and the whole thing. And without any solid evidence, but the supposition is that this was probably used to serve ayahuasca. And that's dated around uh, 2000, uh, around one, you know, the, the turn of, what am I saying? 
<laughs> about 2000 years ago. Uh, if you try and look at uh, it's much, it's, it's not a hundred years. I think it's pretty safe to say that it's more than a few hundred years. On balance, I'd say you could say that ayahuasca was uh, probably between 1000 BC and the present. It, it may have been discovered around 1000 BC. You know, uh, if you look at the balance of the evidence, but there's no definitive proof of that. You know, now if you go with, uh, you know, Graham Hancock, and uh, you know, and, and I'm a great admirer and fan of Graham Hancock and his uh, his book uh, Before America, which I highly, or no, it's called America Before, Before Columbus, basically. But I highly recommend it. But in that book. You know, he has a rather radical theory that uh, civilization uh, emerged out of the Amazon. And there's, you know, he can support this argument fairly well. And in connection with that, he, he assumes or he postulates that ayahuasca was used in these cultures, possibly, you know, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. I mean, but the farther back you go, the farther it, the, the, may, the harder it becomes to defend that idea. He may well be right, but it's hard to bring, you know, definite proof because you're limited because what you can cite, you know, uh, for things like coca, for example, we know that the use of coca is very ancient, you know, because we find them in mummies for one thing, you know, uh, 10,000 year old mummies are found to have coca, cocaine, and, and the other alkaloids of coca in the hair samples. There are some instances of mummies that have harmine in the hair samples, and they go back similarly, uh, not, that, uh, not that ancient, but a couple of thousand years. And that would indicate that they may have been taking ayahuasca or taking Banisteriopsis, one of the components. Um, so this is this is a long tortured way of saying nobody really knows, you know. Uh, but it's reasonable to speculate that they've been around a while. There were, it's more than a couple hundred years, you know, because there were writings of early uh, Spanish explorers and so on that wrote about these, you know, rumors of these plants. There was no scientific evidence really until Richard Spruce came along and and the English botanist around 1858. He observed ayahuasca being used uh, uh, by a couple of different tribes. And being a botanist, he had the presence of mind to collect the plants and even collected enough of the plants for, for chemical analysis. So that nailed it down in, in terms of an actual date. That was 1858 that he reported this, although his work was not published until like almost 40 years later, but he wrote a, he wrote a report about it. Then it was published in uh, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace's book, uh, uh, Notes of a Botanist on the Amazon and Andes, which was 1908, I think that was published. Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we have, we have that, we have, we have that evident that, you know, so what Richard Spruce found was obviously a tradition that probably went back, who knows how long, you know, a couple hundred years, maybe, maybe much longer than that, you know, things get lost in the mists of time after a while, especially ethnobotanical data and lore, you know. And yeah, one of the, those other mysteries of ayahuasca is how, how, someone figured out to combine those two plants, two or more. Mm -hmm. But um, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, ayahuasca is, is a, a vine and, and a leaf um, very often. And I've read that if you were just to look at the amount of plants we know about in the Amazon, there's something like a billion combinations of two different plants together. So um, what, what's your take on, on how something like that happens, how, how, how that kind of combination is discovered? Well, this always comes up and you know, it's uh, it's kind of not as much of a mystery as you might think. Uh, I'm gonna put a uh, link in here. Um, 
these are the so I organized this conference in 2017 called the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And uh, all of the uh, videos from that conference are here on Vimeo. So I just put that link in. You can go uh, look at it. Some very interesting presentations. But the one I want to draw your attention to is the one by Manuel Torres, who is an uh, anthropologist, uh, ethnopharmacologist. Uh, and he, he talks about the origins of ayahuasca and how did it happen that these combinations were discovered. And it turns out that uh, there were cultures kind of overlapping in, at the juncture of Venezuela, Brazil, and Peru, where there was a very active snuff taking culture. And, you know, a lot of snuff, snuff stuff going on. And it was a very active uh, chicha brewing culture. And these things probably overlapped and there was probably at some point, uh, you know, it was almost like craft brewing, you know, the, the people that were making these different decoctions, they grab whatever was to hand and they throw it in the fermentation batch. And in the process of being experimental, they probably stumbled on that, you know, they would put the snuff in, add the, add the snuff from the anatananthra and a time, and then sometimes maybe somebody decided, well, let's put some bark from this vine, you know, which we use for other purposes. And there you have it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, if you ask the indigenous people, how did you discover this? They will tell you, well, of course the plants told us, you know, but that doesn't make sense to a Westerner, you know, yeah, they told you sort of, but how did it really happen? This is most likely how it really happened mm -hmm. that, you know, shamanism and, and uh, indigenous medicine is a, uh, inherently uh, experimental activity. So you get enough people mucking around with enough plants and, you know, you've got people are curious what happens if I add these things into the brew or whatever. So over time, I think that these, these synergies were discovered. And I, I don't think it's really such a mystery. It's just something that we do because we're, you know, we like to muck around with plants. Sooner or later, we're going to get something that actually works. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a really satisfying. Yeah, that's pretty satisfying as, as an answer. I, I haven't actually heard that answer before, but we do have a tremendous um, curiosity and appetite for altered states. So, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it makes sense that, that we would be doing that kind of experimentation. Um, yeah, so I would suggest go to that website and, and look at all of them, but, but look especially at the presentation by Manuel Torres, Dr. Manuel Torres. He explains all this in in great detail. And I, I think he's essentially got it right. Nice. So I wanted to move on to talk a little bit about the, uh, the McKenna Academy um, and, and kind of as a way in um, to talk a little bit about your, your perspective on um, sort of science, the limitations of science and, and what other ways of perceiving um, and understanding the world we need. Because I know that's something you talk about. It's also like a major theme that we, we explore on Rebel Wisdom. And it was, it was cool to kind of read through the McKenna Academy website properly and, and get, a, get a sense of it. But um, yeah, may, maybe we, we could start with that because I've heard you talk about that quite a lot. You know, and you are a scientist, so it's, it's particularly interesting. Uh... Right. Sorry. <laughs> I was distracted. Could you? Uh, oh, the McKenna Academy. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll talk about the McKenna Academy. So here's another nonprofit that, uh, you know, is worthy of your support. I hope I just did a podcast with Tim Ferriss and uh, he kindly stepped up at the end of the podcast and donated $50,000 to us, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Uh, I don't expect that from anyone in this audience, but should you be so inclined, that would be wonderful. We are a 501c3 nonprofit in the state, so we can give tax deductions for donations. And I, I founded the McKenna Academy, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, 
for a number of reasons. Uh, one thing I left academics myself, I'm not affiliated anymore with the University of Minnesota or any other uh, university, but I miss, I'm essentially an academic at heart. So I decided, well, you know, if I can't be a tenured professor at a university, which I never really had, you know, I didn't work that way. I just said, well, I'll just start my own damn academy <laughs> and work from that platform. Uh, but the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, natural philosophy is the precursor to science. Natural philosophy is what uh, science originated from and then tended and then went on to become very quantitative and reductionist and, and uh, in some ways uh, became diminished that way because natural, natural philosophy recognizes that there are other ways of knowing that are legitimate. Uh, that may not be quantifiable uh, or reductionist. So the idea of the McKenna Academy, it's model, the idea is a modern mystery school, you know, like in the tradition of Eleusis. Eleusis was uh, the place where probably uh, people would come for transformative life events, probably were served a beverage made from ergotized barley that was boiled up. And of course, Brian Murarescu just wrote the immortality key. Some of you may be familiar with it. If not, uh, it's very interesting. It sort of started out from where uh, this book in 1978 called The Road to Eleusis. And Brian's book has has taken off from there. But, but the basic idea is that uh, Everyone who was anyone in Greek society at some point would make a pilgrimage to Eleusis and they would be ushered into a dark place uh, at the Telestrion and they would be served a beverage called the Kukion. And it was clearly psychoactive in some sense. People have said, well, it was wine. No, it was a lot more than wine. It may have been fermented, but there were, it was spiked with something. And most likely it was spiked with ergot. And so people had these revelatory experiences uh, that you know, changed their lives. As we know, psychedelics can do that. And they were not supposed to talk about it. It was some forbidden to talk about, but this was like the, the chief mystery of Eleusis. But Eleusis and some of the Dionysian uh, mystery schools, they were, they were, you know, they were schools. I mean, they, they had programs of learning. There was, you know, there was, it was about more than just going there and having these ceremonies. There were, you know, it was a place you could go to study. And that's the idea of the McKenna Academy. You know, we want it to be a forum uh, for the free exchange of ideas. And obviously with, you know, plant medicines are kind of at the center of the concept. Uh, you know, originally, when we founded the academy a couple of years ago, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, agenda was to do retreats, to actually have a physical place where we could do retreats, kind of building on what we've done before. Well, COVID changed all that for now. So we've been trying to develop an online, uh, you know, develop online programs. We've given several, we've done several and uh, eventually we want to go back to be able to doing retreats in South America as we were before. But in the meantime, we're just working online as, as much as possible. Uh, we've got a couple of projects going in South America, a documentary project that we're undertaking to work with uh, uh, a botanist, a gentleman I've worked with for 40 years, believe it or not, named Juan Ruiz, who happens to be the curator of the herbarium in Iquitos. And we're doing a documentary about him and about traditional medicine in general in, in that area around Iquitos and kind of a snapshot of the current state of the art after, after you know, these traditions have been impacted by, by COVID, by ayahuasca tourism and just generally by global change, you know, uh, they've been, so we want to make a, a series of uh, short 
documentaries that looks at different aspects of this. And that's one of our big projects for which we're soliciting support. And then in the next phase, because Juan is the curator of the herbarium at the university, we want to uh, uh, seek funding to make that herbarium a world-class resource for ethnobotanical research in the Amazon or any kind of botanical research in the Amazon, actually. It's got 100,000 specimens in the herbarium. Only about half of them are mounted but we want to find funds to, you know, mount all the rest and then digitize everything and essentially create a virtual herbarium that's online that people can uh, click into. And then the specimens listed there, part of the collection there, you know, would link into other types of scientific databases like phytochemistry databases, genomic databases, and so on. And just make that an open-ended resource for Amazonian plant research of whatever kind. So that's that's part of our ambition. And, you know, we have other even wilder ideas, but it all takes money and time. Uh, we've got a great team working for us, but our, you know, our, our efforts are inherently uh, limited by uh, bandwidth. You know? Yeah, awesome. And we'll put we'll put some links in the show notes uh, as well. It really is a cool um, project and initiative. And I love the mystery school framing because, you know, I, I think there's something uh, almost lacking in, in, in Western culture, uh, which is something like a Lucis or something like a, a true mystery school. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to, to finish on before we open up for, for Q&A is, um, you know, you, you've, I think in Tim Ferriss's podcast, you mentioned, you know, having, having um, had maybe five, 500 or so ayahuasca experiences and you've really been in the field and, and really engage very deeply with that tradition. Um, do you reckon that we, we might see a kind of European, American, Anglo-Saxon, whatever version of, you know, our own sort of ceremonial use? You know, we have, I guess we have our own ceremonial substances in LSD and uh, ketamine, I suppose would be our indigenous uh, <laughs> pharmacology. Neither of which is natural. But, Neither of yeah. which is natural, yeah, true. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just, just your thoughts on that. Like, what, like, do you, can you see a kind of almost um, psychedelics playing a role in, in almost a kind of, you know, I guess Eleusis was a, was a deeply transformative, perhaps not religious experience, but, um, you know, I, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on that. What might happen? Yeah, I think there's, I think that there's great, great, you know, that's something to be hopeful about, you know, as we, you know, as, as our generation, you know, uh, I guess my generation that sort of grew up in this, we're now circling back. And as we try to develop our own, uh, you know, approaches to the use of these medicines that work within our society, there's going to be heavily borrowed, they're going to be heavy borrowing from indigenous traditions. But I, I don't think it really works to try to just imitate indigenous traditions because we're not. We can, we can learn from them. We can adopt some of the rituals and some of the protocols, but ultimately we have to come up with our own tradition. We're, in the, we're at, a, at a critical juncture and a very interesting juncture where we're at a place where we can begin to do this. This is what you see happening. So what I'm encouraged by is uh, the decriminalization movements that are going on in different municipalities. Uh, and that's gonna lead hopefully to a situation where uh, there are already the you know, retreat centers that offer psychedelics in various communities, but they're pretty much underground you know, because they're illegal. But if the laws are changed, these, these uh, centers, these healing centers, can come into the open and operate openly. And I think then there'll be a proliferation of these centers. There'll be more and more of them. And that's the way to integrate psychedelics into our culture, I think, is to try to foster these centers and uh, maybe even create a situation where, you know, rather than people going to South America to drink ayahuasca, bring ayahuasca to North America you know, work with indigenous people to produce it sustainably, 
benefit those communities as the suppliers of the, you know, uh, suppliers of the medicine, but minimize the economic disruption that comes from people coming down there to drink ayahuasca. You can bring the brew, you can bring the practitioners up to North America and everybody, you know, everyone benefits from that, that kind of an arrangement. Uh, so that's what I would like to see happen. Now, you know, that said, again, none of this stuff is simple. Nothing is ever simple. But, you know, in general, I am in favor of decriminalization, you know, and I think that, well, I think the very idea that we could declare any plant criminal is just absurd, you know, uh, and that's the thing. But then there are concerns, you know, for example, um, Native American church and other organizations around peyote have come forth and said, basically, please don't, don't decriminalize peyote, you know, leave it off the list because it's so endangered and just, just fence it off, recognize this is our tradition uh, and leave it to the Native American people to uh, maintain sufficient supplies of it and just don't include it in the decriminalization protocols. I, I, I can understand that impulse. I, I, uh, and I, I think it should be honored. I, I wish there were a better way to do it than say, well, we'll just keep them, you know, criminalized essentially, if we could change it, but say, well, they're decriminalized, but they're protected. And, you know, some sort of con consensus emerges that certain ones like that one and also ayahuasca and iboga, you know, should be lightly used or steps should be making, made to protect them. And a big part of that is, you know, uh, as sustainable sources are, are developed, then it will, can be available to more people, you, you know, uh, but, but we should be mindful of the pressures that this puts on these cultures, you know, that, that basically they're the ones that are cultivating this. And uh, so it, it's complicated, but I, I think, you know, my perspective on all this is there, these things, uh, uh, you know, exist in a cultural context and a historical context, but they also exist in a co-evolutionary context. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot level and, you know, from that perspective, I think that, you know, what I've talked about, some of my writings, some of our seminars is, you know, we have a right to symbiosis, you know, and to form a relationship with a sacred plant is essentially to form a symbiosis with it. And that should be articulated as not simply a human right, but an organismic right, because we're talking about biological associations between our species and different species and uh, to the mutual benefit of, uh, of those species. So in that sense, we have a right to symbiosis and that should be asserted and even in some way codified into law. It should be uh, accepted that people have the right to form, uh, you know, these kinds of symbiotic essentially biological relationships with these plants uh, as, as a, uh, you know, as, as a right of living on this planet and, and interacting with these, with these materials. Yeah, thank you. Really, really nicely said. Um, I want to uh, open up to questions using the hand raising function. And just while people are raising their hands, just, uh, just a kind of question following on from that, Dennis, um, you know, I think that, that I think you call it like the 30,000 foot zooming out view of the, the kind of symbiotic relationship we have with plants. You know, I mean, that in a way kind of transcends a cultural ownership, one might argue, right? So, for example, the mushroom or, or Phanisteriopsis copy might want to leave the jungle or might want to leave um, a, a certain environment and spread somewhere else. So, you know, I mean, our relationship with tobacco, um, and this is probably ideas I, I, I originally heard from, from, from you and, and Terrence, like is, uh, but yeah, so tobacco, we grow, corn, we grow, cannabis, we grow. That seems like one of the, the, the trade-offs is like, okay, part of the symbiosis is we'll spread you. 
but with something like peyote or or Banisteriopsis copy, they're they're quite difficult to grow and they take a long time, right? So what I was curious about is just with with Banisteriopsis, for example, can it could it be cultivated anywhere? Like what where could it be cultivated, let's say, and how difficult is that actually to do? Because I know the supplies, there's talk of supplies also dwindling there. Right. Well, peyote is a difficult one because it does take about 10 to 15 years for peyote to reach uh, uh, you know, to reach maturity. It's a slow growing one, unlike San Pedro, which is a much bigger cactus and it also has a uh, tradition of indigenous use in the Andes, at least as old as peyote. And there's no problem with the supply. I mean, it's abundant. It can be easily grown in gardens. And in fact, it's not even illegal. You can go to nurseries and buy San Pedro cacti and, and grow them in your garden. And they grow very quickly. So, you know, that's an ideal one if we looking for a, uh, you know, a plant that isn't endangered, I'd say San Pedro is a good example. Uh, ayahuasca can be easily grown, you know, it, it's a vine. I mean, the two, the two things there, it's the admixture plants, the DMT containing admixture plants, which grow more slowly, but still, you know, within a few two or three years of growth, you can start to harvest them you get the leaves, you know, so you don't have to destroy the plant to harvest the leaves. Banisteriopsis, you do, but Banisteriopsis is a vine, so it can grow extremely quickly and, uh, and is being grown everywhere in the world. Hawaii is a good example. It loves Hawaii. There's probably more ayahuasca on the big island in, per hectare than there is in the Amazon jungle, you know, I mean, because lots of people are growing it and that's, that's fine. That's, I mean, people are concerned that I've heard it expressed a, a concern expressed that ayahuasca might be an in, invasive species on the big Island or in Hawaii. And again, we have to be mindful of that. On the other hand, if you're going to have an invasive species, it's good if it's going to be ayahuasca, right? <laughs> because people will find uses. I don't think it's going to get out of uh, out of control because there's demand for it. But I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I think again, that's a that's one of the ways that the corporate world and the, and the developed world can support these indigenous communities is by subsidizing growing. Uh, you know, production, even if that's not the medicine that they're developing, just to just ensure that that sustainable supply continues is uh, is a good a good thing. So, you know, uh, it, it's kind of a case by case basis. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is the, you know, the overarching uh, Coevolutionary relationship, the fact that we have been in symbiotic relations with these plants for hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of years, potentially much, much longer than that. I mean, you're all probably familiar with the whole stoned ape theory. And uh, we're actually doing a uh, uh, podcast with Michael Pollan tomorrow. Uh, in mostly to promote his book, but there will be discussion about the stoned ape theory because my brother's book, Food of the Gods, is published by the same company and it's coming out. Uh, it has been out for a while, uh, but we're gonna probably discuss that. It's, it's published by the same company. So we're gonna talk about that. And sometime this year, hopefully, the uh, McKenna Academy is going to do a symposium on the on the stone date theory, uh, uh, which I don't like the name because it, it makes it kind of, you know, it sounds like a joke. It's actually not a joke. The idea is that possibly, you know, as long as two million years ago, we may have evolved in an environment. In fact, we know. In fact, we know very little about the way hominids evolved, but we know that they, you know, evolved in Northern Africa around and and the the rapid development of the human brain and nervous system took place. There are several hominid species that originated there, and uh, 
and we know it was much wetter than it is now and we know there were cattle there and we know that the you know the hominids were probably uh that was probably a major food source for them and if those var variables were there then probably the mushrooms were there because they like to grow on the dung of the cattle if you go to any similar tropical ecosystem any pasture where there's rainfall in the warm tropics and cattle you most likely will find uh psilocybe cubensis which is the which is the one that's you know pan tropical it's globally distributed so cool we got a couple of questions some, some really cool ones in the chat as well but tim you, you put your hand up so please go ahead Cool. Yeah, Dennis, I'm curious for your uh, thoughts and wisdom on, on deriving meaning from psychedelic experiences, specifically like your yours and Terence's ex uh, experience and, and Chirera and, and how you reflect on that, but also like in the, the modern sense, like you hear uh, a, a lot in spiritual communities uh, talking about downloads and transmissions and, and truth as in like you, how you can access the set of truth um, from it, which I, I, I feel is, is quite problematic considering like the, the culture. And so how you reflect on, on that or what, what practices around that should be. Practices around the taking Meaning of making or, or, or integration of like weird experiences. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's part of the territory. People take psychedelics because they have because they obviously are looking for meaningful or even strange experiences. And then the question is, what do you do with that? You know, and in indigenous cultures, uh, well, they've been doing this for a long time. So they have a whole set of cultural expectations about it, interpretations of, you know, what does it mean when the anaconda comes and, you know, you jump into it and, you know, whatever may happen, they have a context for uh, for that. We don't, or we're in process of creating it. So I think this is part of the challenge is to create a, uh, you know, a, an understanding of what the, what the psychedelic experience means. What do these experiences mean? And, you know, uh, one, uh, you know, we're, we're not indigenous people, so we have a different frame for interpreting this kind of stuff. But it may also be that indigenous people, even though they've been working with these things for a long time, in some ways you can't, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are not as confused as we are, you know, with some of this stuff that comes up, you know, I mean, they have to have a framework for interpreting it. So, so do we. Ours may be different because we're you know, we're more, well, I don't know, I don't want to call it sophisticated. I think that's the wrong word uh, because indigenous people are very sophisticated about their understanding of their environment, you know, and, and these things, but we're sophisticated in a different way and we have to come up with our own interpretations and uh, it's a work in progress. The answer is nobody knows, you know. Uh, I, I really am a fan of, uh, you know, the idea that no one really understands the psychedelic experience and anyone that tells you that they do, that they've got it all figured out is probably FOS, basically, you know, either deluded or, you know, or, or intentionally trying to delude you, you know, I think it's good to admit that they, they, you know, occasion these amazing experiences. And in one sense, they're individual. Uh, you know, your trip is never the same as my trip. We can't have each other's trip, but within the cultural context, we can share information, you know? So there's a collective element to it and an individual element. But the thing about psychedelics is there's something that the individual has to grapple with and come up with your own your own interpretation that I guess that's called integration now and uh, you know there are lots of folks that are out there more than happy to help you integrate these experiences and I think that's a good thing that's a sign of 
the maturity of this thing. We're, we're, we're beginning to develop the frameworks and, and the context for using these things in our, you know, hyper-technological, post-historical, post-scientific society. I got a question about microdosing from Daniel, which I'd love to hear the answer to as well, because I'm a skeptic. So, okay. <laughs> Daniel, go ahead. Hey. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, hey. I heard of some recent studies uh, that claim that um, microdosing um, had, there was no difference in comparison to placebo. Um, I think it was for, um, it was uh, psilocybin and maybe something else I can't remember. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just wondering your thoughts on that. Um, well, I, yeah, I am aware of that study and I'm aware of microdosing. I, I tend to, I'm a skeptic about microdosing. I've, I've done it a little bit myself. Uh, I never had much effect that was, per, that was perceivable. I tried it with LSD for a while and I tried it with psilocybin for a while. I didn't really perceive much of an effect you know, uh, not much difference. Uh, and so I tend to agree that, you know, I, I mean, for one thing, the placebo is a powerful thing in itself, you know, the placebo effect. And if you're convinced you're gonna have a benefit, then you will probably have a benefit. And, and it's a benefit that will probably be measurable statistically, you know, but this study showed that basically placebo I mean, I think the outcome of the study was that those that got placebo and those that took the actual medicine both showed improvement in whatever parameters were being measured. But it was, you know, it was the placebo effect, which, which is a factor in, in both of these things. So I'm not convinced that microdosing, uh, you know, ha it has much benefit. Again, I think it, I think it comes down to the individual. You know, if you take it and you perceive a benefit and that continues, then who cares if it's placebo? If it's giving you a benefit, it's giving you a benefit. You know, now a, a, an exception here that I would, uh, a couple of concerns about the microdosing. One of them is this overstimulation of the 5-HT2B receptor. Uh, which can cause a, and this is, comes up with LSD microdosing potentially because uh, LSD binds into the receptors in a different, in a stronger way, shall we say. It's less readily uh, dissociated from the receptor than something like psilocybin. And so there's a constant stimulation of the 2B receptor, which is not the target for psychoactive effects, but it's one of the receptors it hits. And this causes a valvular uh, proliferation of valvular heart tissue that is uh, pathological and potentially dangerous. So that's something to be aware of. There's literature on that. Uh, and and that's, that's one of the issues. And, and then another uh, potential, again, hardly systematically investigated, but a potential area here with microdosing is microdosing with ayahuasca may be a different kind of thing than microdosing with psilocybin. Microdosing with ayahuasca because the beta carbolines have this uh, a couple of things, but one of the things is they actually have this serotonin reuptake activity, tetrahydroharmine, uh, as well as uh, they stimulate nerve growth and that sort of thing. So taking a tablespoon of ayahuasca daily as a microdose might have benefits uh, uh, that the others would not have, uh, but I don't know of anything, you know, published or any any systematic uh, investigation of that. It just seems plausible knowing what we know about the way it works. So uh, got a question from Joan as well. Go ahead, Joan. Dennis, thank you so much. This is my first dive into details okay. about this topic. 
Um, I'm really interested in what you would consider to be the purpose of doing this. Um, could it turn a raving egotist into an empath? Or is it more like psychological, if you're depressed, now you're no, not depressed anymore? Or is it mostly entertainment? Or what's the purpose in your view? And I, I take what you say about the modern mystery school uh, seriously and include that in the picture that you're developing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the answer is all of the above. You know, I mean, under the right circumstances, uh, you know, it, it, it can change you. It can transform you forever. You know, it can change. And in some ways, that's kind of the point. It, it won't always do that. But I don't know if it will turn a uh, uh, raging egot egotist into a, a bodhisattva, but it won't hurt you know, although, uh, although there are limits to these things, uh, a curadero that I like to work with a lot has told me, you know, there are two kinds of people I will not give ayahuasca to. One is uh, schizophrenics, you know, because it's likely to derail them, likely to not be beneficial. But the other is sociopaths. I will not give ayahuasca to sociopaths because it doesn't do them any good. It doesn't change them. So all our hopes that, uh, you know, Donald Trump might have a revelatory psychedelic experience and become, you know, enlightened, I think we can forget that. You, know? you, got, the, you got the hidden question. Yeah, because you have to have a soul. If you're going to cure your soul, you have to have one. I'm not sure he does. But anyway, but then on the other side, you know, there is the... Uh, that, you know, the other part of your question is specific mental problems like depression or trauma or addictions and all these things. There's plenty of evidence that psychedelics can address these. And in that sense, that's very much the, the sort of medical approach and they are effective, no doubt about it. And, and there's more, more information accumulating every day that they're effective. But then the other aspect of it is simply the exploration of consciousness, you know, which is completely legitimate. You know, there are tools for deep inner work. You don't have to be sick to benefit from a psychedelic. You, what you do need to be is probably curious, you know, and that curiosity drives you to have these experiences and, and they can be, you know, more than entertaining, they can be entertaining, nothing wrong with that. They can be even that dreaded word, recreational. I'm not, I'm not against recreational use as long as it's, you know, done in a, in thoughtfully and in the right set and setting. We talk endlessly about the importance of set and setting with these things. But recreational, if you parse that word, recreation, right? And a recreational psychedelic that's not necessarily going to blast you out of the cosmos, but you still, you might enjoy it, but you can learn from it. So there's value in recreational use in that sense. And uh, uh, it doesn't have to be an intensely therapeutic session every time. Um, so, uh, you know, Joan, the, the, you know, the variables here are, are complex and and they're all at play in these things, you know, uh, set and setting. Those are the big ones. And then, but you have to factor into that. What is the medicine? Uh, what are you taking? What is the dose? What's your intention? And that that's part of the set, really. The set is what you bring to the table. You know, can be your intention, but it, it really is you, everything you know, your life experiences and so on, that's all part of the set. So there's this complex set of circumstances. This is why, you know, psychedelics, hopefully psychedelics are uh, never gonna be uh, reach a place where the doc says, take two and call me in the morning. You know, it does not work that way. You know, the, the if it's a psychotherapeutic session, then the therapist has to be involved in the preparation and in the, in the session itself. 
and then in the integration. You know, so this is uh, this this is why this affects the you know the whole cost structure and, and the economics of psychedelics as we try to bring them into medicine because uh, you know the way psychiatry is produced is, is practiced these days people have limited access to the therapists and psychiatry relies over much on on these uh, drugs like SSRIs you know which are really band-aids they don't get to the to the root of the problem but they can they can kind of you know paper over the symptoms but they don't cure you psychedelics can potentially cure a person but it's a participatory thing it takes work you know the person the therapist and the medicine all have to work together to get to that place but it can lead to actual resolution of things like uh, depression and trauma and so on does that make sense? It does. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm also really intrigued at the exception of psychopath, which still <laughs> leaves the whole large question of what used to be called evil. Um, that whole mystery is still open. Well, yeah, the thing is, I mean, it's, it's, it's possible, but you have to be open to this change, you know, and psychopaths sociopaths and folks like that are not really open to the to the change I, su I suppose there are exceptions but in general you have to be you have to be open to it and you're not going to benefit I mean you know it, it's important to remember like the moral dimension of these things really comes from within us you know I mean there's no inherent moral quality to the substances the substances are simply what they do the have the pharmacology that they have and so on. It's what we bring to it that makes it uh, a moral experience or a, uh, you know, uh, therapeutic experience or whatever, whatever it might be. So, you know, I mean, those of us in the psychedelic uh, world, I mean, we all know lots of people who have taken lots of psychedelics, you know, and they're still assholes. You know, I mean, it is not a cure for that necessarily. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that really is interesting and helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. I, I think we have time for, for just about one more. And um, Tarek, uh, you had a cool question that I think would be nice to end on. Thank you, Alex and, and Dennis. Um, so my question is, um, do you have any observations from the field on how indigenous peoples, uh, they view our Western culture? and our need for healing. And um, clearly those are, you know, you have those that are opening up, you know, have open arms and welcome us when we make the pilgrimage to, to heal in, in their lands. And you mentioned some of those who even travel to, to heal us. Is this based on an underlying recognition that there is healing to be done uh, for the Western psyche and for the Western individuals that uh, inhibit our culture? Um, do they have a broader view on the phenomenon of the Western culture and? And the healing that is required uh, of today? I would like to think so. I, I, I would like to think that they do. Uh, you know, we, uh, I mean, I, I, again, looking at it from sort of the co-evolutionary point of view, I do think that, you know, these sacred medicines are not really owned by anyone. And they're kind of the, uh, you know, they're the heritage of all of humanity, you know, uh, their gifts to all of humanity from the earth mother, or however you want to contextualize that, you know, they are gifts, gifts from nature. It just so happens that indigenous people have been the stewards of this knowledge for a long time. And that should be respected because they've kept these, these things alive, uh, you know, these traditions alive. And I do think that most indigenous people, uh, you know, who are involved in these plant medicines do understand that, uh, you know, uh, they don't really look at it from an ownership standpoint, uh, that, but they also understand that, uh, you know, Western culture is right now very much out of sync with nature. And as a result, it's a big threat to nature, you know, because we've lost that relationship. So I think indigenous people realize that this is a way to, to realign, to help us get realigned with nature, you know, but we, but 
you know, and, and I believe it is too. I, uh, you know, I am not somebody who, I mean, I wish it were true, but I'm not somebody who says, uh, well, if everyone would just take psychedelics, everything would be fine. You know, I, I don't think it works quite that much, but I think the more people that take psychedelics and have these revelations, then they can take that message and go out into the world and, and you know, act on it whatever way works for them. You know, so I, I don't think that uh, in, indigenous people would say, you know, we should keep Western people away from these, you know, they're not worthy of them. Well, they're not worthy, that's true, but they shouldn't keep us away from them. We, they shouldn't keep us away from it because there's a possibility of redemption, you know? I mean, it's kind of the same ethical uh, perspective that you find in Christianity and other religions. Well, yeah, we're all sinners, you know, we're not worthy, but that's why we need salvation more than ever, you know? And so it's kind of that idea. I, I, think, I think indigenous people have that, that perspective more than we might think. Yeah, it feels like a very, uh, very nice fitting place to, to draw to a close on, on the, uh, the note of redemption. So Dennis, thank you very, very much for, for taking the time okay. for being here, sharing some wisdom. No, that's a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Alex. Uh, thank you for inviting me. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel check out the membership options there's three different levels of membership sense makers get to join our regular sense maker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around and also the monthly wisdom gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly philosophical journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.